Hey everyone, I'm Joshua Orr, the Mustang Prince, and welcome to Mustang Prince Oil Reports. Now today, I'd like to talk about a certain actress whom I got a chance to meet during December 2013. That actress was the beautiful and talented Susan Egan. Now, you may be asking, how was I able to meet her? Well, during that year, my family and I were invited to a Christmas concert at Soka University by a family who were musicians and members of South Coast Symphony Orchestra. There, Susan was singing lots of wonderful Christmas songs, including some of her own hits as well. Now, before I did manage to meet her, she was in all sorts of entertainment, ranging from stage, television, and films. Most folks know her for being in such stuff like 13 Going on 30, along with Hayao Miyazaki's Spirited Away, as well as the Beauty and the Beast Broadway show, and several others. Now, since today is Susan Egan's birthday, i like to blog the very first film I ever heard her voice in. So, with all that said, let's get started. Released on June 27th, 1997, the movie is Hercules. Now, on with the blog. Hercules, the son of Zeus and Hera, was snatched as a baby by Hades and forced to live among mortals as a half-man, half-god. Now a teenager, Hercules needs to perform a rite of passage on Earth to prove himself worthy of living with the gods on Mount Olympus. With his plucky satyr sidekick Philoctetes along for the ride, Hercules must learn how to use his strength and defeat a series of evil creatures in order to become a true hero. So, what are my thoughts on this movie? Duh! <laughs> I loved it! Truly an awesome and hilarious movie. In fact, it's one of my favorite Disney films from my childhood. So, before I move any further, let's move on to Mustang Notes. In early 1992, 30 artists, writers, and animators pitched their ideas for potential animated features, each given a limited time of two minutes. The first pitch was for an adaptation of The Odyssey, which entered into production in the following summer. However, production on the film was abandoned when it was deemed too long and lacked central characters, and failed to translate into animation comedy. Animator Joe Hader also suggested pitching a story about Greek mythology, but thought his chances of, of plummeting when work on the Odyssey was discontinued. Nervously, he produced a pitch sketch of Hercules and delivered a brief outline set during the Trojan War where both sides seek title character for their secret weapons. Hercules makes a choice without considering the consequences, though in the end he learns humility and realizes that strength is not always the answer. With the pitching session concluded, Hercules was approved for development. Hater pres presented a page and a half outline in his involvement with the project succeeding no further. Turning down several adaptation proposals, the directors John Musker and Ron Clemens were notified of Hader's pitch for a Hercules feature. They said, and I quote, We thought it would be our opportunity to do a superhero movie, Musker said. So, Ron and I being comic book fans, the studio liked us moving on to that project, and so we did Hercules. With Hercules in production, Clements and Musker conducted research and wrote extensive notes for the film. While preparing the script, they consulted the works of Thomas Bullfinch, Edith Hamilton, Robert Graves, and other interpreters of Greek mythology until they reached the conclusion to not portray the traditional story of Hercules. After multiple meetings and story conferences, Clements and Musker wrote several story treatments before proceeding to their first script draft. Now, what are my thoughts on the animation? Well, 
In my eyes, while it has classic 90s hand-drawn animation from Disney, it can sometimes be a bit cartoony at times. Also, it does have some computer animation in it, since it was one of the later 2D films made. The Underworld looks dark, gloomy, and spooky, and for those who don't know, it's not just for the souls of the wicked, it's also for pure and good souls, too. And as for Olympus, it looks very beautiful and heavenly. And lastly, Thebes is a huge Grecian city with folks that have suffered in turmoil and poverty. There are even some stuff around that place that, well, pokes fun at stuff that we have nowadays, like crosswalks with signals, sundial salesmen which poke fun at watch salesmen, even folks who rave about the world ending and all that stuff. Another reason why I like this film is for the action scenes that happens mostly with the monsters and herp fights. For example, there's Nessus. A centaur voiced by Jim Cummings who captures Meg. More on her later. Herb fights him by headbutting him and several punches that makes him lose his shoes and also sends him flying. Later, Herc fights a ferocious creature known as the Hydra, which in my opinion is the most intense fight scene I have ever seen, especially when it gains so many heads after Herc cuts them off. The only way Herc could defeat it was causing a huge rock slide. His battle with the Cyclops was the only time Herc didn't need to use his strength. Instead, he just used a flaming torch and a rope to trip him down. Lastly, in my eyes, Herc's fight with the Titans was awesome too, especially when he beats them by getting them sucked into the Tornado Titan and throwing them into space. However, the one downside about this film, like some films out there, is that there are plot holes. Now, I can't really talk about all of them, otherwise we'll be here all day. So I think it's best if you guys find them out for yourselves. Now let's move on to the songs in this movie. Which are mostly sung by the muses who narrate the movie in gospel style. The songs they sing are called The Gospel Truth, which is sung three times at the beginning of the film. Then, after the Hydra battle, they sing my absolute favorite song in this film, Zero to Hero. While that happens, Herc is a famous celebrity battling several monsters and prevents a friggin' volcano from erupting. And the last song they sing is called A Star is Born, at the end of the film, where the gods make Hercules a constellation. Now, now that we're done with Mustang notes, animation, and songs, let's talk about the cast and characters. Our main hero, Hercules, is voiced by Tate Donovan, who has never done any voiceover work prior to this movie, but... Some folks might know him for acting in the 2007 Nancy Drew movie. Anyway, in my eyes, Herc is a great character in Greek mythology, and this film is no exception. I mean, he starts out pretty clumsy, having a hard time controlling his strength. But other than being strong, mostly, Herc is kind, charming, and looks out for everybody. But sometimes he can be a bit stubborn. Herc also has a song called Go the Distance, which in my eyes is his way of wondering what his destiny is and what his place in the world is like. It even gets a reprise once when he's traveling to the Temple of Zeus and the final time when he rides with Pegasus to find Philoctetes. It's even sung during the end credits by Michael Bolton. And in my eyes, his version of Go the Distance is my favorite because... It's so powerful and emotional. Now let's move on to Pegasus, Hercules' winged horse, voiced by Frank Walker. 
Now, as Mustang Prince, Pegasus is my favorite character in the movie. When Herc was a baby, Her Pegasus was created by Zeus from clouds. I also like how Pegasus is very loyal to Hercules, and he even does all sorts of humorous stuff that not even normal horses can do. Next we have Philoctetes, or Phil for short, the trainer of heroes, voiced by Danny DeVito. Who has been in films like Matilda and The Lorax, which I already blogged. Phil is my second favorite character in the movie. I mean, sure he's strict and has a short temper, but he does have a kind heart. But my one problem with him is that he flirts with girls like the nymphs, Meg, even the goddess Avertiti. Prior to training Hercules, Phil has trained heroes like Perseus, Theseus, even Achilles. And his one dream is that he'd one day train the greatest hero ever that the gods would make a constellation of him. Phil's song is called One Last Hope, which is sung while he's training Herc and Pegasus with several obstacle courses, archery, rescuing damsels, and other stuff. Next we have Susan Egan's character, Megara, or Meg for short. Now, I gotta say, Susan's voice for Meg is a wonder. Voicing as a strong, tough, independent girl who doesn't want to be messed with, and who's also working for Hades. Now, why would she secretly side with him? Well, it's because she sold her soul to Hades in order to save her ex-boyfriend's life, which ended up breaking her heart in the process. As she does get to know Herc, she slowly starts to fall in love with him, and doesn't want to hurt him. She too has a song, which just happens to be the romantic song, I Won't Say I'm In Love, which is accompanied by the Muses. Now, unlike most romantic songs out there, this one is about resisting the process of falling in love instead of wishing for it. Also, during the song, there is a Haunted Mansion reference in it. Which I find is a pretty funny, but clever idea. Next we come to the Lord of the Dead himself, Hades, voiced by James Woods. Who has been in films like Recess Schools Out, Surf's Up, and Stort Little 2. Now, originally, Hades was supposed to talk in a slow, and be menacing in a quiet, spooky way. But, folks thought that James Wood's manner of speaking a mile a minute would be a great take for a villain. Woods did a lot of ad-libbing in his recording. As for what I think of him, well, Hades is one of the several Disney villains I like. He's sarcastic, clever, and has a great sense of humor, but he's really scary when he gets angry. His plan is not only to put an end to Hercules, but also release the Titans so he can overthrow Zeus and take over the world. With him is Pain and Panic, who serve him as his henchmen. Sure, they can be dim-witted screw-ups, but I find it pretty cool that they can shapeshift into anything, like snakes, worms, cockroaches, little boys, birds a bunny and chipmunk, even a female winged horse. Cerberus does not have a big role to play in this. All he does is guard the entrance to the underworld. We also have the Fates who share one eye. Their job is to foretell the future and cut everyone's life thread. Lastly, we have Herc's biological parents, Zeus and Hera. Zeus is still the powerful lightning god he is in Greek mythology, but he has a fun side to him. Plus, he communicates with his son through his statue at his temple. As for Hera, 
Unlike how she is in the myth, she's more a loving mother than a spiteful woman. And now it's time to move on to my final words. Overall, Hercules is a great film from Disney. Despite a few flaws like the plot holes, it still is a childhood favorite of mine. The animation is classic, but a bit cartoony at times. The action and fight scenes are kick-ass. The characters are memorable, hilarious, and fun. And the songs are some of the catchiest I ever heard in the history of Disney. If you folks are interested in Greek myths and would like some humor with it, Hercules is that fun film to watch. I give this film a rating of 97% out of 100. Now, if Susan Egan is watching this blog... I would like to wish her a wonderful birthday, and I'm glad that I got a chance to meet her. As for the rest of you at home, be sure to join me for my next blog, where we move away from Olympus and onto a desert city that I once ruled on stage. Mustang Power.